Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another eMarketer Tech Talk, where we host guests from all areas of media, ad tech, and martech. I'm Henry Powderly, VP of Content at Insider Intelligence. Today, we will learn how to use AI to improve your marketing without sacrificing quality, personalization, or your humanity. But first, I'm really excited to introduce our special guest from The Hoth. Uh, today, we have Rachel Hernandez, and she's Director of Brand Strategy, and she's, pre she's prepared a great presentation for you. Uh, for those of you watching, this is your opportunity to learn. So please use the chat window to submit questions and to communicate with your peers. Now let's get started. Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, super excited to be here. And yes, today we're going to talk about something that I think has been really top of mind, whether you're a creative, you're on a marketing team, you own a business, and that's artificial intelligence and what impact it's going to have on the tra trajectory of what we create and how we are going to continue creating. So there are a few goals, uh, some takeaways that I'd love everybody who's tuning in right now to leave with. Uh, the first is I am an SEO, so we are going to talk about some data-driven SEO strategies. We will loop them back to AI. Uh, that will absolutely help you get some winning results. We are going to talk <laughs> about why AI-generated content is not a threat to your marketing's humanity, but in fact can actually enhance it. And of course, we're going to talk about how to scale your marketing with AI. Um, I know most of us were always trying to figure out um, how we can do more with maybe a little bit less and achieve more. And I think more than ever now is the time when people are really looking at ways to scale without sacrificing quality. Um, and thank you again, Henry, for introducing me. I'm just gonna share a few quick notes about me and, and why I'm talking about this today. Uh, the first thing to know um, is that I'm a writer. I consider myself a writer first. I went to college for fiction writing and creative nonfiction, got into marketing as a copywriter, editor, and now strategist. And I'm a content enthusiast. I am not one to just kind of put some content out there for the sake of it. Its quality is super important and meaningful to me. Uh, now I'm a brand strategist, which essentially means I'm a storyteller. I tell stories about our brand and hope that they resonate with our users. I also do SEO as part of brand strategy for an SEO company. And I'll tell you more about the Hoth in just a minute. Uh, and I think this is relevant to this conversation for a few reasons. Uh, one, you know, SEO for SEO, it's a very competitive sphere. Uh, those are not easy keywords to rank for, and we have to get creative sometimes, and we have to make sure that we're hitting our marks. And I'm going to share those strategies with you. And also, um, going back to doing SEO to it for an SEO company, uh, you know, part of our branding has to be that we're good at what we do. And we have clients who are very in tune with what's going on. And if we have bad SEO, they'll spot it and they're not going to work with us. And I do like humanizing concepts and simplifying things that some might find complex, challenging, or difficult. I think that's part of storytelling too. And we're gonna talk about good writing and, and how to communicate with your users so they don't feel like they're being talked down to. Uh, and I am gonna talk a little bit about the Hoth. We won't spend too much time on this slide. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we are an SEO and digital marketing company. We work with people from all over the world in businesses of all sizes. Some things to note, uh, we were founded in 2010. So in SEO years, that's like pretty old. <laughs> um, we've been around for a long time. And one of the reasons I think that is, is we've really been able to balance uh, quality and a quantity of output. And one of those reasons is that we are a white label company and that's how we started. We work with different end users now too, but a lot of our clients are actually digital marketing and SEO agencies. So basically they don't wanna do the production work for SEO, PPC, SEM in-house. And we give white label reporting that they can put their branding on, give that to their clients, and then they get the glory. But what that means is that we have to do a lot of work. Some of our clients have hundreds, thousands of users, and it obviously has to be high quality because they're putting their own name on it. 
And so I'm going to um, kind of move into SEO in just a few minutes, but I wanted to start by planting some seeds about AI and why it works or how it works so we can sort of lay the foundation around some of the controversy and also some of the ways that you can leverage it. So the main thing to think about is that AI, when it's generating content for you, so think about when you're maybe in your Gmail account or in a Google Doc and the, the software is finishing a sentence you've started. It's using natural language processing or NLP. And what that means is it's actually drawing from content that already exists somewhere on the web, somewhere on the internet around either the sentence that you're writing or if you're using an AI software like uh, Copymatic AI or Jasper, formerly known as Jarvis, it kind of understands where you're going because it's already synced up with everything that's already around that subject. And that's why uh, when we're using AI for content generation now, things like current events, news, even super niche content that there's just not a lot out there about it yet, it can still be challenging for these softwares to figure out what you're trying to say. Because like us, like humans, it uses context clues and that allows the software to help create some content for you. And this isn't new technology. For instance, Google's Rank Brain, so a ranking tool that they use, and a lot of Google's ranking is done by AI, does the same thing. It turns the keywords that you're putting into a search bar into concepts. So here's an example. So we have Paris Hilton here, and there are two different searches people could be doing, probably more than two, but two different searches that people primarily are doing when they're searching for Paris Hilton. Uh, one would be a celebrity that uh, I think most of us know of, uh, but maybe somebody is traveling to Paris and they want to stay at a Hilton hotel. Uh, then contextually, it would make sense for them to be looking for a different type of Paris Hilton. Those context clues are what the AI uses to figure out which Paris Hilton we're talking about. And this is why it's so important for your content to be very comprehensive and to include the kind of context so that the AI or Google knows the information that you're trying to relay. And I want you to keep this in mind as we start talking about SEO, because I'm going to talk about quality and quantity of content, and that kind of seeks back into how we can leverage AI to help us um, produce more, but not sacrifice anything that we're doing well right now. So here's some strategies that I think and I know will help drive better rankings and conversions. And this is also important. I'm going to just take because sometimes I see people kind of there are these murmurs that SEO is not really worth investing in anymore or that search engine optimization it's, is on its way out and it's being replaced by other things. And this is a very recent study that shows that no matter what like the new take is, search engines, meaning Google, are still the first place where people go when they're looking for more information about a product or a service. And I'm not saying don't take these other mediums or these other platforms into account, but as marketers, uh, it is our job to get in front of people when they're looking for more information about the value our businesses are providing. And studies show that search engines and Google are still the first place that they're looking. And when we're really trying to take advantage of that and we're trying to optimize our websites so that our users can find us, of course, we want to take into account Google's ranking factors. So these are the things that are going to help your website rank higher for the keywords that are more valuable for your business. Big takeaways here, biggest piece of the pie is the consistent publication of high quality content. And the two things to take away from that are the words consistent and high quality. They do not stand alone. If you are regularly, let's say every day you're publishing content, but it's not well written and it doesn't solve the user's query, you're not going to rank. Conversely, if you are publishing really amazing quality content that's super comprehensive, but you're doing it very sporadically, you're not going to rank either. You really need both for this content to have an impact. 
And then the other key players here, and they all kind of go back to that content creation, engagement with the page, uh, niche expertise, and backlinks. <laughs> um, and we're gonna talk about backlinks in a second. But engagement with the page, I remember a lot of Google's ranking systems use AI. So they're gonna be looking for certain triggers to show that your site's providing value. If somebody is going from one blog post on your site or one resource to another or to a product page, that means that they're engaging. If they are opting into a list or sharing on their socials, that means that they're engaging. And what Google will see if that happens is that your content is valuable and worth ranking. Niche expertise is really big now too. Uh, the content sphere has gotten super, super competitive. And because Google wants to send their users to the best possible answers to their questions, they've done a few changes recently, some algorithm updates. The main one here would be EAT, and that stands for expertise, authority, and trust. Uh, basically, they wanna know that you know what you're talking about when you tell people what to do on your site. This is especially relevant for any industries that are in what we call the YMYL sector. So that would be your money or your life, things like medical, financial. Uh, basically, will this content have an impact on the quality of somebody's living? Then you really have to make sure that you put that expertise in there. Backlinks are so important. This is, we're getting into offsite SEO, but it does go back to content. A backlink essentially is from another website links to yours as a resource. Uh, and this is super important and you can see why this would be a ranking factor for Google. If somebody is linking back to your site, it shows that they think it's valuable and a good answer to whatever question they're answering. Google can see that and then it can see that your site is relevant and thus your rankings will go up. That said, backlinks are super hard to do. Um, I do a talk where I ask everybody in the crowd to, I say, raise your hand if you've ever um, had to build backlinks or do link outreach before. And, you know, feel free if you're at home and you've done it, raise your hand. I have. Um, and then I ask them to keep their hand up. And I say, keep your hand up if you enjoy building backlinks. And inevitably, everybody's hand goes down. Really, really hard to pull off, especially if you don't have great content, but still very, very essential to your site's SEO. So bottom line is high quality content and links. That's the cornerstone to any solid SEO strategy. It's certainly the cornerstone to ours. And again, I work for an SEO company. And when we talk about high quality, consistent content, we're primarily talking about things like blogs, resources that people can turn to. And here are some really great stats. Uh, if your site has a blog, congratulations. You're getting 55% more visitors than sites that don't have an active blog. You also have 435% more search indexed pages. We just talked about how people are going to Google first when they're looking for more information about a product or service. So why not take those opportunities to get in front of their eyes? And I know I did my spiel on backlinks. I, I hope there are some people tuned in who know the pain. I've definitely been there. If you have quality content on your site, you have 97% more backlinks. So congratulations again. You've kind of conquered one of the toughest parts of SEO. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, these are actually from our own site. And this is from a year ago. So what we're looking at is Ahrefs, um, great SEO software. Uh, I completely recommend if you're looking for a great tool that will help you with keyword research, et cetera. And this is showing our traffic from October, 2021. We were at about 63.5 thousand organic visitors through search per month. In just one year, we have more than tripled our site's organic traffic by active blogging. And I'll talk about the consistency and things like that in just a moment, but we are at 231, almost 0.5 organic, thousand organic visitors per month. Um, so very, very significant uptick in our traffic. And this is just from producing a lot of high quality content. 
and how much, right? So how many, how many blogs I'm telling you blogs are super important to your SEO strategy. It's absolutely true. How many do you need? This is from HubSpot. This is a study they did and they found that more than 16 blog posts per month, or at least more than triples your site's organic traffic. So that's actually what we do. We do a blog post every Monday through Thursday. And what's really interesting about this graph to me is that the difference between like two posts, four posts, even eight posts, it's kind of negligible, right? You don't really see the needle start to move until it hits like that 16 number. And I get asked this a lot. So how long should those blogs be? And this is a study from CERT by Q. Uh, main takeaway here, if you're looking at this graph, uh, virtually, nothing, no content is ranking on page one anymore. That's less than 2000 words. The days of ranking for a 500 word blog post are long over. And I am not telling you to just like hit that word count, pad your post with a bunch of fluff. No, it has to be quality, but Google wants to send its users to the best, most comprehensive answers to the question. And at this point, uh, 500, even a thousand words is probably not going to cut it most of the time. So uh, we talked about blogging, but there's other content marketing that we have to do, right? So. Um, we're doing our 16 blog posts per month. You're, I'm hoping doing a monthly or bi-weekly newsletter. I know ours went out just a couple days ago. Uh, you have your email campaigns, right? The ones that are ongoing. So your promotions, maybe your nurture campaigns, your transactional emails. We have our paid ads. We do a lot, for instance, with Google ads and social ads. Uh, organic social, we do one to three posts daily. Of course, the platform is going to depend on your industry. Uh, we do a lot with marketing. So it's LinkedIn. We do a lot with Instagram and TikTok. We have your lead magnets, your white papers, your webinars, et cetera. And video, of course, we can't forget video. It's so important. Uh, YouTube, we all know, is the second largest search engine. I recommend producing one video per week. Uh, and then that's in addition to anything you want to have on your website. So if you have product videos, how to's, welcome videos, etc. All right, so let's get back into AI. I know we kind of had a taste of it earlier, but um, I know I'm, I'm saying that we're creating a lot of content and that we have to do high quality. So what can we do about this? How can we leverage AI? And I know there might be some people uh, who are kind of side-eyeing that, that AI, like Homer is side-eyeing the robot in this slide. Um, and I've definitely been one of those people, especially as a creator. But we're going to talk about some ways you can use the software to really not only up the quantity of your marketing to be competitive, but to enhance its quality. And... Um, uh, there are going to be a lot of science fiction references <laughs> during this webinar, um, but don't panic. So this is from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams. Um, you know, I know change can be tough, but we're also already and we have been working with a ton of AI tools. Things are advancing a little bit now, but it's going to be OK. And we're going to talk about how these tools are going to make you and your team stronger. So. We'll talk about the controversies, and these are the things that I see in the marketing circles I'm in and the fears that people have surrounding AI. Uh, one being it's going to just be bad, spammy, regurgitated, and even like, God forbid, plagiarized content. I see people worried about whether there's going to be a penalization from Google that they're going to get caught using AI for content and that their site's going to be de-indexed. Uh, people worry about the loss of thought leadership and point of view, that there aren't going to be new ideas because everybody's going to be using AI. Remember that NLP thing, and we'll talk about it more. Job loss. Uh, job loss for creatives when we're talking about AI for content generation. But I think we've kind of heard murmurs about people losing jobs to robots or AI for a while. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just purely the loss of the magic of writing and content creation. Again, I'm a writer. I come from a writing background. So this is something that spark is something that's very important to me. So fear number one, uh, bad, spammy, regurgitated, or even plagiarized content. Let's break this down. So let's remember our NLP. What is making people nervous? 
the natural language processing part of AI, where it basically takes from everything that already exists. So that's where it gets its context. That's how it knows what you're talking about. And that's how it knows what writing to create. And because of this, people are afraid because if the AI is drawing from what's already there, is this plagiarizing because it's not creating anything new. So my challenge here is I'm not sure if this necessarily means that anything has changed because people already think that plenty of content, if you are in marketing circles, if you're in marketing forums, that plenty of content is already repurposed and regurgitated from research that's already been done, from things that are already out there, from topics that are already trending across various industries. So my argument is that AI tools don't change this. We're already kind of taking from what's there a lot of the time, but it helps streamline what is currently a manual process. And this is not set and forget, certainly not yet. And I, I don't think really ever. We still need writers and editors to polish our text. We need strategists to figure out what we're writing about. We need people to add our brand's point of view and our character. And we should be doing this already. We should already have multiple drafts and editors for content. We use AI tools for content creation all the time. The Grammarly Chrome extension saves my life multiple times a day. Uh, I use the Hemingway app and I have the Hoth writers use it to check for readability and passive voice. Uh, again, Gmail and Google Docs will literally complete a sentence for you. Sometimes it, the sentence, the words that it suggests aren't what you're looking for, but sometimes they're better than what you were thinking and you go with those. You have this choice with these new AI softwares too. And the idea of plagiarism, you know, this isn't new. Um, and I'm talking about AI specifically here. And I think it really stems from spun content, which was sort of this old black hat SEO tactic. It was an AI generated content, but it was really bad. And it would create thin keyword stuffed content made only for search optimization, just for link building. And here's an example of what that looked like. And I'm going to give you guys just um, a minute to kind of get an idea of what this content is. So this first sentence alone, quite often you may find yourself wondering which words should be capitalized in a title or header. What is alarming about this content to me is not the fact that it was written with an artificial intelligence tool. It's that it's really bad. I don't want to read any more. I don't think the first sentence is necessarily true and uh, it's not bringing any value to anything <laughs> at all. I have absolutely seen human writers write content on this level as bad as this. And I have seen AI generated content that is much better than this. And we'll see a few examples in a minute. The problem with this content is not where it came from. It's that it is unreadable and doesn't provide any value. So how can we use AI to create better quality content at scale? So we're not just gonna rely on the AI to write that content for us, but what we can do, and if there's anybody on the call who could use some time back and who couldn't, that's where the real value for me lies. It's not in the sense of just clicking a few buttons. So we're not telling our creative teams, okay, all you have to do is kind of click, 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 and you'll have a blog post or a Facebook headline, but it does free up their time to be more creative and more detail oriented because we're not starting from scratch every time we try and create a piece of writing. And I just imagine like I've met and worked with marketing teams and I've met marketing teams from brands that are household names. And so many of them are, are just like a one or two or three person show. So imagine getting that time back, having to do less research, less initial drafting, uh, building on something that's there. Every writer will tell you that good writing is actually rewriting. And so the power of being able to start with a text already on the page and move forward is super, super powerful when it comes to creating quality content. 
And it's so important. I mean, this is from the horse's mouth. This is Google. Um, users know good content when they see it and they will likely want to direct other users to it. It's going to influence your website more than any other factor. Uh, this is the number one Google fa ranking factor right now. Uh, so why not use tools that can give your teams the time to really enhance your content and make it the best on the web. And here's an example um, of how this could work. So this is a tool called Copymatic AI. This is one that I use. It's similar to a Copy AI or a Jasper. And what we're doing is generating a mission statement. So you can see it's given us a few examples. And I love this because it's very simple. It gives us a few different points of view, a few different styles. And I know sometimes I get asked, can I have four variations, five variations, six variations of this thing? And I'm like, man, I only have three in me. So it's so helpful when you have a tool like this to draw ideas from, and then you can take what works, you can build on it, or you can leave what doesn't. And we're gonna take a look, little look at a case study. So um, I'm gonna talk about Vanguard for a minute, a huge investment company. They've got about $7 trillion out there and they increased conversion rates by 15% by using AI uh, to help with their paid ads. So Vanguard, of course, their target audience is going to be on LinkedIn. All of their paid ads are done there. It's their only paid advertising uh, and it's an incredibly saturated space. And the issue that they ran into was they couldn't easily figure out like what the best copy was to convert. The A-B tests were kind of unclear, they weren't conclusive, and everything was very manual and time consuming. So they turned to AI for content creation and they used it for copywriting formulas. Um, these are very traditional pain, pain agitate solution, um, attention, interest, desire, action, et cetera. Uh, the tool I just showed you guys, Copymatic, has these built in too. And then they did content personalization based on audience interaction. So again, like you go to Netflix, it tells you what you wanna watch based on things you've watched before. This is kind of something that freaked everybody out like a few years ago, I feel like, and now we expect it. We want Netflix to know who we are and what we're looking for. We want that user experience to be enhanced with that AI. So we're gonna take a look at some copy. Um, and on the left um, is the example that the Vanguard creative team created. And it's okay, it's not bad copy, um, but I wouldn't say it's the most compelling. Um, I wouldn't say it's something that necessarily really drives a click. On the right is the copy that was created using an AI generation tool. Uh, so we believe the right support can amplify the good you can do for your company, see how Vanguard institutional services can help your plan succeed. This is great copy, in my opinion. This is very emotional. It has a great impact. It's super, super compelling. And it would definitely drive me to click more than the human created content alone. So let's talk about our next fear. And I, I hear people kind of freaking out about whether or not Google is going to penalize them for using AI generated content. So let's break this down. So things that make people nervous. Um, one, we just had an update called the helpful content update. So this is a very recent algorithm update came out um, about end of August. And Google said that it wanted to prioritize content written for humans and not search engines. So think back to that really bad spun content about capitalization we saw that's just keyword stuff and ridiculous. This isn't new, right? This isn't something that's new for Google. They're not gonna wanna rank content that doesn't provide value to the user. That said, um, I thought that Vanguard content was really good, really, really well done. Uh, communicated the value that it provides, spoke to the needs of the audience. So my argument is that as long as you're speaking to your users and you're providing value, you're good. One of the things that happened with the helpful content update, if you're an SEO, you know, um, people were very nervous before it was launched. We thought it was going to have, be a big disruptor. A lot of people weren't impacted. And that's because I, I really think most of us work hard to provide really good content for our sites. Google is also not in the habit of de-indexing sites anymore. Um, this is so, so rare. It's kind of like a myth that goes around. Uh, sometimes your content or links won't count towards rankings, so you'll waste resources, but you're not going to be like kicked off the internet because you get caught doing something wrong. And I'm not even saying that using AI is wrong. It's not. But I do want to say, um, and I always think 
when I talk about this, that the analogy, you want to wear the clothes, not wear the, not let the clothes wear you. You want to use the AI. You want it to enhance. You want it to help uh, bring out your personality. You want it to help you connect to your users, but it can't be the only show. You have to have some stop gaps. You have to have some quality control and you have to make sure that you maintain your brand's voice and humanity. So some things we can do uh, to enchant our audience in Google, which is really the same thing, I think, at this point by using AI. Um, and I pulled up some Facebook headlines here. This is for one of our products, Hoth Blogger. Um, I love it, again, for quick variations for titles, headlines, email subject lines. This is so great for A-B testing. Um, you can see what your audience responds more to. You have more options for segmenting. Uh, you can flesh out ideas that you have. Uh, the AI may generate some writing that you may not have thought of, uh, may have an idea that you wouldn't have considered or an angle. Uh, so it's just giving you more options. And I always go back to the time saved. The time saved by the grunt work, the brainstorming part of the day where you are just done and you're banging your head against your laptop. I know I've been there. This can be applied to testing, elevating the copy or design, further segmenting, further personalizing your content, all things that we all know we need to be doing more now than ever before. Another fear that we're going to break down is a loss of thought leadership and point of view with the content we create. Um, and this is super relevant. We're going to go back to that natural language processing idea. AI is using content that's already out there. And so the fear is that because the AI is drawing from what's there, nobody's going to be saying anything new if we're all just using AI and we're essentially creating a content marketing echo chamber. <laughs> um, and that those who use AI uh, generated content are going to fall behind because they're not gonna be thought leaders. They're not going to be sharing new ideas. So these are the fears and we're gonna break down where um, they're not necessarily true. So yes. Brand voice, knowing your audience, point of view, these things are gonna differentiate you now more than ever, they already have been. But again, I argue that there is a correlation between good ideas and having the time and energy to not only come up with them, but to execute them. And imagine the time that you could spend on low quality first drafts, manual research, manual testing, pour that energy into strategy, creativity, having an angle or a hot take, being the first to break something, how would that go for you? How would that go for your brand? And I also invite you to consider the funnel. You know, there is a place for all different types of content. There is absolutely a place for thought leadership content. There is also a place for simple how-to content. That is great top of funnel content to bring users who are just exploring what you provide in. And the fear, oh, this one, um, it, it hits home because I, I talk to so many people um, who are afraid of being replaced, whether it's by AI or whether it's by freelancers or outsourcing. Um, so let's break this down. Uh, so the fears are that AI is going to replace us in our teams. Why? Because we think that people are always going to choose the cheaper, easier option, which not necessarily true. And then the big existential dramatic threat is that we're going to be left in a wasteland barren of creativity, surrounded by bad, glitchy, horrible content. So I'm going to return to the argument because I really want to drive this home, but I completely disagree with this. Um, I think any tool, whether it is an AI software, whether it is using some other automation, whether it is outsourcing some tasks to a freelancer to get more done, give your creatives, give your idea makers more time to be creative and to ideate. If you can take things off of your plate and give them the opportunity to go above and beyond and succeed, they're going to do better than keeping the things that are kind of holding them down and in the day-to-day -day, um, on their plates. And then they can really focus on that big picture and the real issues that determine success. This is how people move up in their careers. This is how you move into manager, director, VP, C-suite positions, uh, is being able to have that time to ideate and focus on the big picture and to delegate, whether it's to a team member, a software, or something else. And if we look at this graph, yeah, I mean, the biggest struggles with content marketing to me all stem from not having enough time to kind of figure out all those other little things. 
So the uh, last fear was going to be losing the spark or the magic, but I think we've kind of gotten to the point already. Um, you know, if you start with some AI generated content, get some ideas from it, get a baseline from something that a software creates, it doesn't mean that you're not writing. It doesn't mean that you're not editing or, or strategizing. You're not going to lose that magic, I promise you. And you're already using these tools already. Um, Grammarly, um, we have, uh, you know, various tools in our arsenals that we're using every day. We're just kind of getting more used to them now. So we don't think of them as AI. And this is the future. The train's left the station. Um, either figure out how to leverage it to your advantage or you're going to be left behind. And um, again, I'm going to repeat this. Make sure that you're using the AI. It's a tool. It's an enhancement. It's something that adds to your efficiency. You're, you don't want to let it use you. So I'm gonna circle back to our key takeaways. Um, quality content's the number one Google ranking factor. You've, you heard it from Google themselves. And it's a key to brand awareness, consistency and quality. And these are things that so many businesses struggle with. I work with them every day. Content that's useful or has a point of view gets more links, more shares, more visibility in general. It's great for branding. And this is how we can leverage AI because it's not about replacing our setups, it's about allowing them to thrive. Give your teams the time and energy they need to stay ahead of the curve. And off-page SEO is key. The right content and strategy get you there. And I would be remiss if I didn't shout out my own place of business. Um, again, we've been around for a really long time. I'm part of the Hoth. We are an SEO company. We do on-page and off-page SEO. Uh, I'm going to pull up my email here now absolutely reach out to me if you need any help um, and reach out to us. We definitely would love to help with your site's marketing content and SEO. And um, thanks. I'm going to toss it back to Henry because I'm so excited to answer some questions about SEO, content creation, and AI. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was awesome. Uh, really insightful. It's such a fascinating topic, and I know lots of marketers are talking about it. And I have to say, as a writer, uh, you made me feel a whole lot better about the possibility of AI replacing me someday. So thank you so much for that. Uh, but we have lots of questions, so let's get to the first one. Uh, first question is, what are some important things to keep in mind when using AI content generation tools? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so there are definitely a few different things that I recommend keeping in mind. Um, number one is, um, give them a try. So most of these tools have free trials and there is a little bit of trial and error sometimes when you are creating different briefs for the AI to use. And I know that might like kind of scare people off, but I mean, I've hired literally hundreds of writers at this point. And it's the same thing. You kind of need to get used to each other so that they can figure out the software can figure out your voice. Budget is already really big too. So make sure like you have an idea of how much content you need and what tools. There's Jasper is the most well-known, um, but you don't necessarily need to pay for like this huge fancy account. Uh, I, again, really like Copymatic AI because it's very simple. It's very user-friendly. It doesn't break the budget and it gets what I need to get done. Um, so I would definitely say, give them a chance, take advantage of demos, free trials, et cetera, get kind of used to incorporating them into your workflow. And then also keep in mind your budget. Don't just buy like kind of the first fancy thing. There are a bunch out there um, that aren't necessarily the most well-known that will get exactly what you need done, done. That's great. And, and there's a, you know, you've mentioned a few tools and there's a question about tools. So you've said Jasper, Copymatic.ai and Grammarly. Are there other tools that are useful? Yeah, I mean, for uh, search engine optimization, there are definitely some tools that help with um, keywords that help you optimize your content. Uh, some of the ones that I've used before, and I've used them all with success, um, ClearScope is great, uh, Market News, uh, Server SEO. Essentially what these tools do is you plug in a primary keyword and it takes the first 30 results from a Google search and shows you uh, commonalities in terms of what their headlines are, what their keywords are, the parts of the subject that they're covering, so that when you're going to create your own piece of content, you can already see what Google thinks is a comprehensive answer, and then you can kind of go above and beyond what they've done. So that used to be something I did manually, like I would have these crazy spreadsheets, and now there are these great AI tools that just do the work in seconds for me, and they'll usually have like a Chrome extension, so you can connect it to Google Docs. 
it's pretty it's pretty neat. That's awesome. Yeah, and that and that lines up with another question we have here, which is more on the keyword research side. So how can you use AI to research and prioritize content topics and keywords? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And then again, um, I think one of the ways that we can use AI besides those tools like Market Views and ClearScope. Um, so there's a different SEO softwares um, you could use. Uh, and actually the Hoth like has a free keyword planner. Um, SEMrush, Ahrefs, uh, Google Keyword Planner, all of these things I uh, use AI to kind of help draw what search terms are most popular. Um, so in terms of how many people are searching for a keyword during a particular time and how difficult they are to rank for. So which websites are ranking for that specific keyword? And then you can kind of see if you're able to rank for it. So um, the most, you know, keywords that are more competitive would be the ones that the biggest brands in the world, your website's probably, if you're selling shoes, your website's probably not going to beat Nike, right? So you can kind of determine where you can go for that um, lower hanging fruit. And those keyword tools will show you different keyword variations, go for the less competitor, longer form ones, and then you'll probably see more SEO success and SEO builds on itself so that you can go for those more competitive keywords later. That's great. Thank you. Uh, this one's about uh, blog posts in general, and, and I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but the question is, is there a recommended percentage of content that would be AI generated on a website? Is there a recommendation there? I think it really depends on your industry um, and what your team looks like. So, and again, I want to make it very clear. I'm, I do not recommend just generating content using AI. I think you absolutely need a writer, an editor, somebody to look it over. There needs to be a stopgap and some QC. So I wouldn't say there is a percentage, but I would go back to those 16 blog posts per month and knowing that those blog posts should probably be about 2000 words. What's the capacity your team has right now? Um, and also what industry are, are you in? If you're in something very niche, it might be difficult to use AI right now for long form content. Um, I would say if you have your top of funnel, I think I kind of touched on this during the presentation, your how-to posts that are very simple, your things that are going to draw their user in when they're initially looking for things about your business, that's great for AI content. When you're writing content, that's going to be a little bit more thought leadership. That's going to maybe be like a case study or something that's a little bit more involved. Then I would maybe move that more towards that human element using your creative team to do the majority of it. But I wouldn't say there's like an optimal percentage. It's really based on what the content is and what the need is it's trying to meet. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, now for content that's AI generated, you know, this question is asking about EAT since, since authority is one of those factors and one signal of authority is the author name. Um, how do you handle that with AI generated content? You have uh, somebody who's an expert or somebody who's on your team familiar look over that content put them in the byline. Um, this is, I mean, this, again, this kind of, I don't think has, has changed, especially for a lot of people. A lot of people are already outsourcing their writing to freelancers. Um, but the stopgap, that QC person should be somebody who's able to pick out the things that are fluff, who's able to add that value that only an insider would know. And then you can give them credit on your site. Yeah, that makes sense too. All right. We have time for one more question. So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask the last one. What's the biggest impact on using AI uh, that it will have on your site's SEO? Oh, I mean, I think, again, it really goes back to that quality and quantity aspect. So, I, you know, there's no, there's no limit. It's a tough question to answer. But the one that I think people can really walk out of this presentation with is that you'll be able to create more and that you'll be able to up the quality because your teams are going to have more time to pay attention to the finer details, which makes them able to compete with those giants that you don't necessarily think you compete against. SEO is literally a rankings game. It's literally you're being ranked um, by number. Uh, and so the ways that you give yourself a leg up are by the number of outputs, the consistency, the quantity of content, but you can't sacrifice the quality. And that's why I think AI could be such an amazing tool to kind of democratize what's what's already going on, especially because the industries are so saturated right now. 
Yeah, that's so true, Rachel. Well, thanks so much. This has certainly been quality content. We really appreciate your time and for sharing these insights with us. Um, before we wrap up, let me take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketers media channels. Uh, you can register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars at eMarketer.com webinars. On the audio side, don't forget to tune into Behind the Numbers, eMarketers daily podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And finally, please check out our newsletters. Keep an eye on your email for the link to today's recording and the slides. So once again, thank you all for your time. Thanks again to Rachel and to, and to the entire team at the Hoth. We'll see you on the next Tech Talk.